It's 2002, one year after Super Smash Bros. Melee was released, and before the competitive scene really started to take shape. During this time, esports as we know it really only existed in one place, South Korea. While the rest of the world laughed at the idea of competitive video games ever reaching a mainstream audience, South Korean organizations had already begun forming teams of players to play the real-time strategy game StarCraft Brood War. Televised matches on major South Korean networks soon became the norm, and competitive StarCraft took off. Today, 22 years after its release, Brood War is still played competitively. This is especially impressive considering the sequel, StarCraft II, was released in 2010. Most impressive of all, however, is that Brood War has not received a balance patch for the game since 2001. What this means is that every aspect of the StarCraft metagame has developed independently from Blizzard over the past 19 years. As new players and strategies emerged, the meta redefined what was and was not possible. Even when a remastered version of the game was released in 2017, Blizzard deliberately did not change a single thing that would directly affect the game's balance in order to preserve what makes the game so great. But there was one thing that did change in this long history. While the players continued to develop new strategies and techniques to push their respective races to the limit, it would be a lie to say the changes in the meta came entirely from the players alone. Instead, changing the maps available to the players allowed the community to affect the balance of the game without directly changing anything that made the game so great. For example, if early strategies were becoming too powerful, switching to a map with a larger distance between bases gave the defender more time to prepare their defenses, effectively nerfing early rush strategies and incentivizing players to play differently. Similarly, if a map had a long grounded travel time between bases, but a short aerial travel time, you're more likely to see strategies that rely on aerial-based combat or drop-based strategies. In the most extreme example, if you have a player like Flash, arguably the greatest esports player of all time, who hadn't lost to a Protoss player in a best of five in 11 years, yes you heard that right, 11 years for a game that has three races, he never lost to one of them for 11 years, you could intentionally alter the map pool to deliberately nerf Terran, the race that Flash plays, and end one of the longest streaks in esports history. All of this without ever patching how the game works. Okay, but what does StarCraft have to do with Melee? Well, when you compare the two games side by side, it quickly becomes clear how much they have in common, despite being fundamentally different genres. Let's try and break it down. Both games came out decades ago, yet still have strong competitive scenes to this day. Both games rely heavily on mechanics and APM to the point where if a player has better tech skill, they can literally beat a superior strategy through speed alone. Both games have rich storylines and players across each era, and both games, against all odds, have managed to stay relevant for years in spite of sequels, competitors, and an ever-changing competitive scene. So because of all these similarities, it's clear that Melee and StarCraft can learn a lot from each other particularly when it comes to balancing a game that is, in my opinion, already pretty close to perfect. How do you keep Melee fresh and interesting for years to come without fundamentally hurting the integrity of the game? Well, why not just copy what's already worked for StarCraft? What would happen if we changed the stage list in Melee? How much do stages influence the game in the first place? What would happen if we made our own stages? Well, that's exactly what we're going to answer in this video. Okay, okay, but should we really influence the metagame of Melee? Like StarCraft, the version of Melee that's played today has essentially remained unchanged since shortly after its release in 2001. Wouldn't changing Melee mean fundamentally ruining what makes this game so great? Well, yes and no. The reality is that Melee has experienced enormous changes in its metagame since its inception, and these changes have come from player innovation and changes to rule sets. Let's take a look at the very first official Melee tier list, made around the same time that Brood War was blowing up. Right off the bat, modern fans of the game can see opinions have really changed. Mario and Zelda at 5th and 6th, Captain Falcon at 15th, Puff at 17th, Bowser at 20th, actually no, that one's pretty obvious, I guess even back then. Anyway, the point is, as new players and technical developments were discovered, public opinions and matchups changed significantly. In fact, it wasn't uncommon to see characters in Melee jump several spots in the tier list, even late into its game, sometimes just because a single player started to learn how to abuse their strengths. But opinions on characters aren't the only thing that's changed. Stage lists have too. When the game first started, the stage list was obviously very different from how it is now, but it's amazing to look at the competitive stage lists in Melee that were used even a decade ago. For example, here's the stage list for Apex 2009. Okay, so Pokemon Stadium wasn't a counter pick yet, but Corneria, Jungle Japes, Rainbow Cruise, Green Greeds, Mute City, Brinstar, Congo Jungle, and Pokefloats were all legal counter pick stages. To put this in perspective, every single stage on the list that I just mentioned is now banned, and frankly, to a modern player, this stage list probably feels a bit ridiculous, especially when you consider how long the competitive scene had been around by 2009. So what changed? Well, like with StarCraft, the changes to the stage list were influenced heavily by characters and players. 
From the character side of things, one example is that any stage of the walk-off wasn't competitively viable to, among other reasons, to the existence of wave shining. On the other side of things, there are a lot of examples. In the case of Rainbow Cruise, you can basically thank PPMD for single-handedly inspiring the community to ban the stage after his victory over M2K at ROM 3. Throughout Melee's history, as the meta and players develop, our definition of acceptable stages has changed with it. Because of this, I'd argue it's completely reasonable to have an evolving stage list over time. And while I disagree with any proposed changes to Melee's balance in terms of characters, as it would likely do more harm than good, changing the stage list is a much more conservative approach to keeping the game fresh without fundamentally altering what makes it so great. For this reason, I think if the game ever became too stale, or one player was too dominant, changes to the stage list would be a great way to mix things up. In fact, if you stop and think about it, Melee is in quite a unique position as a fighting game because its stages actually affect balance significantly. Most fighting games' stages operate as just a background for the fight, rather than something that plays a role in the matchup in any meaningful way. Even among other titles, in other genres, it's not uncommon for major esports to have a single map for the game, like in the case of League of Legends. However, some of you might wonder how impactful a stage actually is. I mean, it's easy to see the difference between playing on Battlefield versus playing on Poker Floats. One is a consistent neutral stage, the other is... well... not that. But the differences between the stage we do play on is still very significant. Within the tournament legal stages, there are actually a surprising number of differences between them. We do know the obvious ones, so I won't spend too much time on them. Stuff like FD having no platforms, which makes escaping combos difficult or straight up impossible, how bigger stages with higher blast zones make you live longer, whereas small stages make you die earlier, and bigger stages give you more room to play patiently, and smaller stages force interactions. But what about the less obvious differences? Yoshi's Story, Fountain, Final Destination, and Dreamland allow Fox and Falco to wall ride the stage when recovering, which makes ledge techs easier for them and other characters. Battlefield is not like that at all. It's a small difference, but it plays out in a big way in many matchups, and buffs certain edgeguarding options significantly. What about differences with platform size? Yoshi's has more narrow platforms, which makes it easier for certain characters to follow up, especially on reaction. On the other hand, Dreamland has wider platforms, which makes it much more difficult to follow up on tech chases or cover several options with a single move. Remember, we're talking about a game where a few frames can make a world of difference, so increasing the distance that a player travels after a tech can be all it takes to make a follow-up not possible on reaction. Platform heights also play an enormous role. Changing the height of platforms makes it so some options completely disappear by slightly moving the platform higher. Marth loses the ability to cover the top platform on Dreamland with a full hop. Peach struggles to make it to the top platform at all. On some stages, you can punish characters with short hops on the low platforms. Other stages, you can't. Recovery options and ledge options change a lot too. Most recoveries get a lot worse on FD, especially characters like Sheik, as landing on a platform instead of the stage can make things tricky to follow up. Once that option disappears, Sheik's recovery becomes a lot more predictable. Platforms also allow for ledge cancels, and some characters can even ledge dash onto them and retain invincibility. When you take all those things away, you're also taking away complex aspects of the game's strategy. Even differences that seem incredibly small actually matter a lot. Marth's down tilt covers quite a different angle on Yoshi's story than it does on, say, Battlefield, simply because Yoshi's story is slightly slanted downwards on the edges. As you can see, if I tried to seriously cover every subtle difference that affects the top tiers, it would probably take me over an hour, and I wouldn't even come close to covering them all. So what matters is this, subtle changes to a stage can seriously impact the game. There's almost a kind of butterfly effect when it comes to stage design, so it's crucial to pay attention to the little details. But how do all these changes actually affect matchups between characters? Well, thanks to the matchup calculator on I Need Data, we can actually get a pretty good idea, at least theoretically. Let's look at an example. Most players would probably agree that Mirth beats Fox on Final Destination. The lack of platforms makes it so Mirth's chain grab and combo flowchart is significantly more powerful, as Fox players cannot use the platforms to escape. On the other hand, Fox's up air combos can be SDI'd, which makes it harder for Fox to punish Marth as aggressively, and can even lead to potential reversals. So for the sake of simplicity, let's assume Marth and Fox go even on every other stage except for Final Destination. And let's be a bit bold and say on that particular stage, Marth should beat Fox 70% of the time, assuming both players are equally skilled. Well let's watch what happens. You'll notice the matchup actually does not change at all in a best of 3, since it assumes that Fox players will always ban FD but in a best of 5, suddenly the matchup is 60-40. So that 10% change in the matchup all came from a single stage, and even a more conservative estimate would still radically affect the matchup. But all of this is an oversimplification. Most players probably wouldn't agree that Marth and Fox go even on the other stages. However, the point isn't to argue about which stages Marth wins or which stages Fox wins, it's to demonstrate that a single stage can literally turn an even matchup into a 60-40 matchup just because of the current rule set. 
If we banned FD and just FD, the matchup would change enormously. In fact, our entire tier list would probably change. For the sake of time, I encourage you to look at other examples on your own to see how stages play a role in the matchups. If you're interested, I'll put some theoretical examples on screen and you can pause to check them out, but remember, they're just theoretical. The interesting side of Melee is that it's far from solved, so examples like this are just opinions. Regardless, too often players fail to acknowledge how the existing stage list affects certain matchups. You cannot simply imagine matchups in terms of how it plays out on Battlefield alone. A single stage makes a huge difference, even if the edge that stage gives them is as subtle as 5%. Okay, so now we know that stages make a huge difference in melee. Let's go back to that StarCraft example one more time. StarCraft uses maps instead of unit changes to balance the game, which kept it fresh and interesting for fans and players alike. But what would happen if melee did the same thing? Stages aren't the only thing changing the meta in melee, but they are the only balance changes that would come from rule set changes rather than player innovation. This means that we have more control over changes than just hoping the meta develops on its own. But what would happen if we started introducing new stages entirely? Let's pretend Nintendo doesn't hate us for 5 seconds and imagine a world where new stages were introduced to keep the game fresh and interesting. Well, we actually already have custom stages in the game through 20XX, proving that this would be quite easy to implement if we wanted to and if we were able to. If it was anything like StarCraft, an entire stage making community could develop and we'd pick the stages that we liked best. TOs and community leaders could collectively decide on potential stage lists and rotate them every 6 to 12 months to keep things fresh. Which leads us to the final question. Do we even want this? You know, if I'm being honest, I think it really depends on the state of the meta. Right now, I'm actually pretty happy where the meta is now, but I also think exploring concepts like this is a lot of fun. The way I see it, these kinds of changes are only necessary if the game starts to feel stale. And while Melee is fresh and interesting right now, I think it's useful to look at ways that we could keep pushing Melee in order to make it relevant for the next decade. I know the biggest barrier right now is Nintendo, but considering these ideas still serves a purpose. And ultimately, all I wanted to do with this video is to get players thinking. To get players to understand how impactful a stage actually is, and explore the potential future of a game I love. My name is Radar, and this has been the very first episode of Meta Defined. If you enjoyed this video, please consider subscribing and clicking the bell to get notified when I make my next video. And most importantly, share it with your friends. If you really want to help out, you could support me on Patreon, link in the description. Or, since I recently became a Twitch affiliate, if you have Twitch Prime you'd like to send my way, check out my stream. Finally, if you do want to see more of me, I've been doing weekly commentary during quarantine with my pal Save as Untitled for his Untitled tournament series. You can check out the VODs on his channel, or tune in on Mondays and Tuesdays on his stream. Also, if you enjoyed the music in this video, all of the tracks are original, so let me know which ones you felt worked best. And most importantly, thank you to Evan Oliver for helping me with all the clips I recorded, and to Autumn K and all my patrons for supporting the channel. That's all for today, and I'll see you guys next time.